Thanks everybody for um, coming to, to today's micro seminar. This is the last seminar of um, 2021. Uh, we've had a, a really good year, so thank you everybody uh, for coming along. Uh, thank you to our speakers and, and thank you to all our, our audience. We've had a, a really good, uh, a good year. Uh, for anybody who hasn't um, come to one of our seminars before, um, general format, and it's a loose format, is presentations of about 30 minutes or so, uh, give or take. Um, we kindly ask you to keep your microphones muted during that time so as not uh, to interrupt uh, the speaker. And if you do struggle with any internet connection, um, if you turn off your camera, uh, that can often uh, improve things. At the end of the talk, we'll have uh, time for a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and, and discussion session. If you want to ask a question, we'll invite you to, to unmute your microphone. Um, but if you don't want to, to unmute your microphone, um, by all means, type a question into the chat uh, and one of um, our hosts will, will read it out for you. Uh, and as always, many of you are, are, are working at home or on unusual time zones. Um, so life is going on around us. And Uh, Greg, you've been muted. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so if if you have to get up and go, um, please, uh, please do so. Um, and at the end, there is time for everybody to catch up with a bit of a social, um, which isn't recorded, and it's a chance just to, to, to catch up with everybody here. So today, whoops. Uh, so today I'm really pleased to say that we've got uh, Mark Sear, um, who is going to talk about um, uh, Neanderthals in the Thought Forest. So without much further ado, I'll hand over to you, Mark, and thanks very much for, for uh, giving this talk. Let me unmute myself first and then start sharing my screen. Can you see my, my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay, why is that? Why is it not become? Hang on. Yes. And the pointer. And can you see the laser pointer too? Uh, so we run the um, um, present review. Okay. Okay. Well, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I would. Sorry, Mark. I think are you sharing on two screens? Uh, we can see the present review, but not the um, uh, display view. Oh, sorry. Okay. How do I change that? Uh, if you go to should be display settings and then yep swap presenter. Okay, like that. Okay, Perfect. no, ah, ah, I have two screens, but there were okay. Now I can see <laughs> the presenter view on my other my other screen. Okay, it was, that was I didn't I didn't know that. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Today I will talk about uh, research that I did for my PhD already some some time ago. Um, in recent years, I've been mainly working on uh, the hominin sites Paleo Lakes uh, drilling projects. Uh, but for two reasons, I will not be talking about today, that today. One reason is that Greg was already present at a talk of, of mine uh, some years ago, which I, I talked about uh, the ASPDP. Um, and even though those cores have a very different age range and different research question, the, uh, the methodology from a paleomimetic point of view is, is, is quite similar. And also um, this work uh, of my PhD, I never really presented for a more paleomagnetic uh, uh, community. So this is a good opportunity to do so. Um, it's a PhD in Paleolithic archeology. span So it's gonna be a bit archeology span heavy. Uh, so the title of my talk is uh, Neanderthals in the Forest, which is also the title of my uh, PhD thesis and uh, a correlation with the Blake event with the Emian pollen zones. So I'm gonna start with some background information um, as we know that modern humans are distributed all over the globe, but from the fossil record, we can infer that our ancestors had more limited distribution. And from one or more core regions in Africa, our ancestors solely expanded and contracted the, their geographical range. And uh, with changes being attributed in the range, being attributed to climate change, environmental variation, and technologi technological innovation. So te technological innovation, for example, stone tool type development, uh, development, fire use, that kind of thing. That means that understanding the ranges of hominins helped us uh, understand their climate and environmental tolerance and their techno technological and social skill set. Due to the long history, uh, research history in France, Neanderthals are the best known hominin species beside Homo sapiens. But still the geographic range and especially the modification in this range, range through time are poorly understood. 
the migrations of Neanderthals towards a middle and higher latitude would be instrumental for understanding the limitation in terms of biological and cultural capacity, cap uh, capacities. One of the key uh, periods in this aspect is the Emian or Ipswichian in the, the UK, also known as the last interglacial or MIS 5E, the, the last and best documented interglacial stage that the Neanderthals were, uh, were present in Europe. And the other talk will argue that MIS 5E and Emian terminology should not be changed interchangeably and that caution is needed when using these terms. And this figure, you see actually like a, a palimpsest of Neanderthal distribution. So this is not a time slice, but actually a quite a long duration of the thought expand, uh, range of Neanderthals over Eurasia. During the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, warm uh, and temperate interglacial periods like the present day uh, were thought to be ideal for the survival hominids because of the final diversity and the climate, climatically favorable conditions. Although a lot of us are sitting in the cold uh, today, I just, uh, I just heard. Um, but however, during the 1980s, British archeologist Clive Campbell argued that interglacial Europe may have formed a hostile environment for hominins and that Neanderthals lacked social structures and specialized knowledge and skills that would enable them to survive. In, a way, in other words, Neanderthals were not clever enough to, uh, to survive in such uh, complicated environments. An example for this is, for example, that uh, it is, is that in interglacials, you have more solitary animals roaming the forest, while in other times you have large herds uh, in the open plains. And you can imagine that uh, hunting for a large herd in the open plain is, uh, is much easier than hunting a, a solitary animal in the forest, which requires a lot of knowledge of the environment, hunting skills, and communications, which Neanderthals are thought to not to have had, at least in the 80s. The lack of well-dated Emian sites seemed to support uh, this, and this was central to Gamble's uh, theory. However, during the 1990s, Will Rudux, which is my uh, 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 PhD director, and colleagues analyzed in detail chronological, archaeological, and paleoecological paleo records available for the region, and this showed that not only archaeological sites were present in Northwestern Europe, but not in the United Kingdom, but also that they were present, were present in fully interglacial deciduous uh, forest conditions. But even today, the debate about ecological tolerances in Neanderthals is still ongoing, particularly in, their North, particularly in Northwestern Europe, with the real limits of their distribution, both in space and in time being an important issue. issue. My research aimed to contribute to this debate by developing a more precise correlation between chronology and environmental conditions of certain Northwestern European sites with Neanderthal presence. And for chronology, we have used, surprise, surprise, of course, paleomagnetism. One of the more recent uh, paleomagnetic excursions, the Blake event, that was first described in 1969 by Smith and Forrester and has been correlated with the MIS uh, 5E in marine cores. At the time we started the research, the duration of the Blake event was quite short and was used as the base of the MIS 5E uh, uh, and Emian and the late middle uh, Pleistocene boundary. At the end of the, this presentation, I will show that this is no longer the case. Before going into the data from the sites that we have studied, I need to say something about Emian and MIS 5 terminology. In 1874, Professor Harting was the first to use the term Emian after the River Aim in the Netherlands as a stratigraphic unit. Near Amsterdam, Amersfoort in the Netherlands, he noticed a consistent occurrence of sand and clays with mollusks and, uh, and diatoms. And among them were species with the Mediterranean and West Iberian uh, uh, occurrence and do not occur uh, in present day Netherlands as they prefer a warmer climate. During the 1920s, pollen research were able to identify the non mollusks bearing uh, levels of the Emian and correlate them over large parts over Europe. Uh, nowadays, the lower boundary of the Emian uh, is placed where the tree taxa exceed 50%. So here it is, where the tree taxa exceeds 50% of the terrestrial pollen sum, and the upper boundary is placed when the, this goes below the 50%. And it's in between the vegetation of the Salian and the Vaxillian uh, glacials. The duration of the Emian in Northwestern Europe has been estimated at 11,000 years by far counting an extrapolation of sedimentation rate at uh, the German site of Bispingen by uh, Müller in 1974. 
uh, the varves occurred in the lower part of the sequence. So the lower part of the sequence, as you can see here, number uh, one is extremely detailed. So 100 years, 200 years, 450. But the higher up you go into the sequence, there are no more varves present. And the, the, those durations of these different pollen zones are estimated in sedimentation rate. So there are the longer duration, but then also there's more error margin in those, uh, in those uh, estimates. Um, in Southern Europe, actually the duration, uh, uh, okay, uh, this, uh, well, sorry, I have to go back in one step. The duration of the Emian in Northern Europe has been estimated 11,000 years, while in Southern Europe it has been estimate, estimated as 16,000 Europe, 16,000 years, which is a, uh, quite a big difference of 5,000 years, and which is a problem if you wanna uh, use the Emian as a chronostratigraphic unit. For the MIS curve, uh, this is less, the iconicity is less of an issue because the boundaries are arbitrary and reflect the global ice uh, volume change. And also paleomagnetic excursions are thought, uh, are believed to be uh, global uh, in, in over the, all over the world, global in, the, in time. So just, uh, sorry, it's, you know what I meant what to say. <laughs> so next, uh, these are the sites that I, I want to talk about. This is Normark in, in Eastern Germany, Kaurs in, in France, and Rutten in, in the Netherlands, very close to the type locality of the in, in, in Amersfoort in uh, Amsterdam. Let's start with Normark, or Normark Nord, as it's uh, officially co called. It's located south, 10 kilometers southwest of, uh, uh, of Halle, west of, of Leipzig. And actually, the sites consist of three sites, Normark Nord 1, 2, and 3. And it's situated in the Giesenthal, an area which has been known for brown coal mining over the last 300 years. Due to the large scale mining activities, research has been going on for the, the last three decades. And Normark Nord 1 was discovered in 1985 by uh, uh, Professor Tomei and it was excavated until 1995. And in that same year, the Normark site two and three were discovered. According to Professor Mania, the age of Normark Nord 1 can be placed in intersalian interstadial and has an age of around 220,000 years ago. Uh, and, and a similar age uh, was estimated for Norman Nord 2, but there was a, within the team, there was a big discussion about the age of Norman Nord 2, uh, leading to a detailed research of that site. Here you can see Norman Nord 1 with uh, flintstone uh, stone tool scatters along the edges of the, of the basin and a lot of uh, fallow remains all through the basin, and some with butcher marks. And this is actually the the normal north two cycle we talk about, and these are these squares are 100 by 100 meter, uh, meters. Mining stopped in the 1980, uh, 1990s, and the man made valley has, has been made into a recreation lake. Before uh, 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 the archaeological sites would be lost for research, a large scale rescue excavations took place from 2004 to 2008, excavating all year round and yield a, a rich archaeological uh, assemblage of around 20,000 Middle Paleolithic artifacts and 120,000 faunal remains. The faunal remains uh, in include uh, a lot of warm tempered species, including uh, street tusk elephants, one of the tusks you see being excavated here in the lower part, uh, rhino, bovids, equids, deer, beer, uh, bear, and all small carnivores and, and a lot of uh, other animals. In order to develop a fine-grained paleo-environmental and chronological framework for this unique archaeological record, the basin infill was studied at a, by a wide, wide range of disciplines, um, and also because of the disagreement about the age of the site. And these studies yielded climat climatic and chronological proxy records, which are of great relevance to the study of the last interglacial. The infill, the genesis, and the artifact-bearing deposits, in particular, were meticulously studied and documented um, in a large number of sections throughout excavation. A key section is Hauptprofil 7 or main profile 7, HB7, that cut through the deepest part of the infill. And the section was sampled a wide range of techniques for paleo environmental studies, including sedimentological, morphological studies, further pollen, mycobotanical remains, mollusks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, for high resolution paleomagnetic samples, were taken at five centimeter intervals. Uh, over the entire sequence. All data indicates uh, a, a, a geological rapid infilling of a shallow basin and micromorphological study 
shows that the cementation uh, was nearly continuous process without pronounced soil formations in period of non-deposition. For the paleomagnetic research, we took 184 samples, of which 159 were taken with dedicated perspex uh, sample containers and 25 samples were drilled. In the paleomagnetic laboratory of Fort Hoofddijk of the University of Utrecht, we, the samples were stepwise demagnetized uh, using AF up to 100 mini Tesla, thermally up to 600 uh, degrees and a selected set of samples were first heated up to 205 degrees uh, to remove the viscous component and then followed by an alternating field demagnetization. Here we see two uh, di cytophil diagrams of Normark Nord 2. Uh, no GRM is indicated in these two diagrams, but it was present in some, in some samples. When no clear endpoint direction was observed, the samples were labeled of quality two and later excluded from inter interpretation. I just want to point out that none of the samples in the Saiva diagram are fully reversed, which you can also see in this figure. When we plot our results next to the stratigraphic column here, uh, it shows a, a stratigraphic core hint zone from 7.7 7, uh, 7 .7 to 1.7 meters with clear deviation of declination and inclination. Uh, and we associate this zone um, as, as with the Blake event. When we combine it with the pollen data from Professor Barkles, we can make an age estimate of duration estimate of the, of the Blake event. Because we, as I told before, we know the duration of this zone one, two, three, et cetera. And also it's very important uh, that to see that actually the Blake event here starts before pollen zone one. That's a key observation. So when we com combine this date of the pollen with the duration of the Blake event, although there are some excursion directions here, but they're of low quality, so they're excluded, we come to a duration of 3,400 years plus or minus 350 years. Also, a lot of rock magnetism was done. I just want to show the slide that it was done. I'm not going to go into the, <laughs> into the, into the detail of the rock mag. If people are interested, I can uh, supply the publication. But of all the sites, detailed rock magnetism uh, uh, was done and they uh, show different magnetic carriers in all, in all sites. Also, we know from course in the Mediterranean, the location of the Blake event in relationship to Sapropel S5. We know that this, the Blake event has been discovered. Here's Sapropel S5. The Blake event is on top of it, Sapropel S5 on top of it, et cetera. And we know it also in the relationship with the M marine isotope stage curve 5E. Um, from a, a core of the Western Iberia of the Iberian Plateau, we also, we also know that the Emian, estimated at 16,000 years, starts well, or starts before the MI5E plateau over here. And from the same core, we combine this figure because uh, the Blake event also was discovered in that core. But unfortunately, in one publication, they used depth and the other publication, they used age. But fortunately, they, in the supplementary information, they used a, a, um, a correlation table was published so we could correlate this figure. And we see that here, that the Blake event of the same core starts well, starts around the top or after the top of MI's 5E curve, but well, um, after the Emian 5E, uh, sorry, after the start of the Emian, which is opposite to what we've seen in, in Normark. So when we combine all this data, uh, we plot the start of the Emian in the, in the West Iberian core, the MD 952042. Uh, we, we, we plot the, the, the duration and the age of the subpropel as five. And then, as we know from Normark, that the Blake event just starts slowly, a little bit before the start of the Emian at, at Normark 2. We plot that here. And then we plot the start of the Emian at Normark 2. We see, and then we see that there's actually quite of a large lag time between the start of the Emian in Southern Europe and the start of the Emian in Northern Europe. Again, a big an issue uh, for uh, the Emian as a chronostratigraphic unit. Um, but the next site I want to briefly mention is Kaur. I'm not going to go in big and in, 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 in detail about this site. Just it's a site in the in the Somme Valley, uh, formed by uh, by uh, tufas and travertine. Uh, and travertines are formed by a little spring, a little bit uphill, 
um, but no pollen were discovered and the sequence is quite short. But we did in, um, find um, excursion directions and together with OSL data, also we have interpreted uh, this as the Blake event. And again, you see, uh, well, you see a, a declination of 197, but uh, another, but a, a positive inclination. And, but, and sometimes you do have a negative inclination, but not again, uh, not a fully reversed uh, declination. Quite similar uh, directions as a normarked, but not fully reversed. The last site I want, I want to mention is, is Rutten, which is not an archeological site, but it's a site the, that we um, drilled with my uh, uh, colleague Jan Peters. Well, actually he paid for it with his PhD research. So yeah, he was funded by an oil company. So. <laughs> And this is a, a, a core of 25 meters and it was non-rotational. So this was pushed downwards uh, without any rotational movement. So ideal for paleomagnetism uh, because you do not lose the asymmetrical orientation. Uh, as you know, in cores, uh, often uh, excursions or reversals are identified on, based on the inclination. But in the, during the Blake event, this inclination is not always of, 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 of uh, not always fully reversed, so not of much help. But the location of the site was chosen because we're, uh, it was the uh, high probability to find a complete Indian pollen sequence. Okay, so here is, is the sampling took place. And then perspex uh, sample containers were taken, but also uh, quartz, uh, handmade quartz containers were made for thermal demagnetization. And in total, we took uh, 252 uh, paleomagnetic samples over 25 uh, meters, uh, 180 of them for uh, thermal demagnetization, 134 for AF demagnetization. Uh, this, uh, up to, we magnetized up to 100 mini Tesla and we used the so-called per component protocol because we believe that iron sulfides could be dominant. Here you saw, you, I showed two uh, thermal uh, uh, demagnetization diagrams of, of, of that core. And you can already tell by the, the, by the latest steps that indeed, indeed iron sulfides are, are, are quite dominant in this interpretation because after 350 degrees, samples are, 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 like, uh, are like empty. And again, no, not fully reversed. When we plot our paleomagnetic data uh, next to the stratigraphic column, we again see that the Blake event starts before the top of the Eemian pollen zone here, E1. Unfortunately, we didn't drill deep enough to find the lower boundary. Uh, but in different to, to Norma 2, it, it uh, lasts up to after uh, pollen zone 6, or so after the top of the Eemian. So here the Blake event has a duration that um, covers the complete Eemian, which would mean that the Blake event has a duration of 11,000 years. But then again, the complete uh, duration of the Eemian is, is an estimate, especially the larger part. There's a lot of margin of error of the last of these top zones that are estimated to be 4,000 years. At the same time, um, um, my um, a colleague of mine, Mark Bourne in the University of Oxford, estimated also the duration of the Blake event using uh, a Marine Corps and uh, um, thorium, in thorium access, of thorium access, 230 access, uh, for the sedimentation rate. And he estimated the duration of the Blake around 6,500 years. So a lot longer than previous thought. Uh, but there's a bit of a difference with my estimate, but um, again, the full duration of the Indian in Northwestern Europe is, 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 is quite rough, it's quite a rough estimate. Combining uh, this data in, the, in this new figure, again shows uh, that the Blake event starts after subtropical S5, uh, that the duration is, is probably longer than we estimated in 3,400 years in, in Normark. Um, um, and that there's a large delay of around 10,000 years between the MIS 5, uh, uh, 5E start and the start of the Eemian in Northwestern Europe. So why, is this, why does this matter for, uh, for archaeology? Like I, like I showed before, we have an uh, archaeology, we have uh, Neanderthals present in Kaur during the Eemian, uh, but if you uh, place the start of the Eemian uh, with a long delay, instead of a, like a, a similar delay between North and Western Europe, it has, has, has um, consequences for, the, uh, for uh, what happens if you arrive to Western Europe and the sea level 
at the sea level stand. So if you arrive at the Emian at the same time as the Emian starts here, then the sea level is still low. But if the Emian starts uh, significantly late, by the time you arrive with your uh, in the Emian here, actually the 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 the, the, the channel is, is completely filled, making a crossing uh, quite complicated. So in that aspect is uh, why it's important for the Neanderthal range. Um, uh, one more slide that I showed before. So these are the difference between uh, the 2010 and 2020 chronographic chart. So no longer is the, the Blake the base of the Emian and no longer, uh, sorry, uh, the Blake event is no longer the base of the Emian and no longer the, uh, the base of the, the middle Pleistocene. As you can see that the, the duration is longer. Uh, it has been moved up a bit to com compared to the late middle, slime, middle, late middle Pleistocene boundary and um, and it's not no longer used as the base of the Emian. Uh, and that was it. I don't know how long I lasted actually. <laughs> uh, that was perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we can all uh, give Mark a, our virtual round of applause for um, a, a really interesting talk there. Yeah. So I think uh, we can open up the floor um, to questions. If anyone has one, you can raise your virtual hand and I'll invite you to, to unmute. Nobody's got a question. I've got I've got one to sort of kick off, and I, I mean, maybe maybe you mentioned it, and I I wasn't quite sure. I mean, you were talking about how the Emian is 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 uh, starts at, at different periods based upon location in Europe. So what what actual markers are used to denote um, the onset of the, of the Emian? Is that sort of by a strat stratigraphic marker? It's a, or? It, it's a pollen it's a pollen zone. Okay. So, so when the tree taxa uh, reach uh, over fifty percent of the terrestrial pollen sum, that's where the base of the Emian is. Okay. And that well, it, it's uh, yeah. But using uh, uh, flora and fauna as a chronostratigraphic <laughs> marker is a problem. But but the Emian is a chronostratigraphic marker, but not a good one in my. In... Uh, yeah, I guess I, so. I, now I understand why there there is a geographic and climatic dependence on on where this boundary appears then. Yeah. yeah, but that was one of the comments in the reviewers. It's like, yeah, but you're saying that there is a delay of onset, but it cannot be because it's a chronostratigraphic marker. Uh, yes, but <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I'm. I think I missed it. Um, but uh, what I understood you to say is that the length of the Blake is variable with location. No, and no. I wasn't sure how many, how broad your location coverage was because I guess I wasn't. Paying I don't. Th there, there, it's not. Uh, I don't think it uh, depends on the location. It's just that in Normark North, the the top of the sequence, the, the quality of the data was lower, and I decided to exclude quality two hmm. uh, from the interpretation. So there are quality two excursion directions, but I I had already decided to exclude them. Um, so now. With hindsight, if you go back, actually, you're, there is a there is there there are indications of Blake also at the upper se sequence of 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 Normark Nord two, uh, and why the quality is is uh, is not good is probably because that has been more nearer to the servers and have been more oxidized. Um, okay. So, uh... what, but there's of course a different. Like Mark Bourne did a, did a, a detailed study of a core and he used uh, the sedimentation rate. And he estimated six and a half thousand. So if I estimate that the in, in the written the whole duration of the Emian, it's based on what we think is the duration of the Emian. And there's an and there's a, a quite large margin of error and especially in the top part, which is the, the longest part. So I think six and a half thousand could be well, or, or but there's all of course margin in, in, in Mark Bourne's work, there's also a margin of error. So I think if you come to more than seven thousand years, I think it's uh, I think it's quite likely. Uh, and there's, uh, you don't have any uh, paleo intensity records that would uh, help in determining that. Uh, I do, but let me see. I haven't looked at them in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but you're, you're dealing here with a terrestrial record, so it's not. You have you're, you're quite limited. I have a have a, mm -hmm. a, a, a paleo intensity record, but it was I was not. Yeah, I have it here in front of me. It's not quite useful because it, it's not just not long enough. You need a, you need a longer sequence mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Say something. Thank you. And it's right. 
Thanks very much, Cathy. And does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, uh, Vivi? Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Mark, for this, the nice talk. Um, I, I just wanted, have, are you following this, um, the paper by Jim Channel and, and Vigliotti about this um, extinction of the Neanderthals and the relationship to the, to the La Champ excursion? And, and uh, do you have an opinion on the, what happened at the Blake event, if, if that's <laughs> actually true or not? <laughs> well, I, I have not read the response yet. There has been a, a response in science, I think, last week. All right. But, but um, um, which I haven't read yet. But uh, first of all, I think yeah, it's called the um, uh, Adams event, he's, he's called it. Uh, that, well, my first reaction is why not during the Blake event, which is a lot longer. And, uh, and mm. but this, this type of arguments that uh, ext extinctions and uh, cultural innovations of hominins are related to, uh, to, to, to reversals or uh, pain intensity lows. Has been along already since the 60s, um, and there's so many uh, lows in paleomagnetic intensity, so many reversals, and so many things happening that you can always make a correlation of everything. Um, so I'm 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 not convinced uh, at all. Uh, no, uh, big, no. <laughs> hey. All right, thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, uh, Anita. You have have your hand up. Yes, if I can, if nobody has a question for now. Yeah, go for it. Okay, okay. I have uh, several questions, but uh, one is, uh, I don't know if you've seen our latest paper on the Flint uh, absolute pole intensity. So I guess if you could, uh, I'm happy to discuss this further, but if you yeah. could uh, recover some material of, of uh, like Flint material from those uh, uh, sites, uh, I think it would be an invaluable source for for checking uh, the polyintens, the absolute polyintensity. I, I, I don't, I don't know. You wrote, you wrote that paper? Yes, I will. I will email. I will email it to you. Please send it. Uh, please send it to me. Yes, yeah, sure. There's, there's twenty thousand artifacts. Okay. So uh, uh, it's promising. <laughs> yes, the, and and. Well, yeah. And there, there's uh, okay. I, I, there, I have still good context in, in Leiden. So if you, if you're interested in in, in doing yeah, something. The, that's great. That's great. The the flint tends to be weak, but there is a master of magnetic enhancement in some of them that will allow to obtain absolute pole intensity. I will further you. And some of the, some of the flint is burnt also. Yeah, yeah. So in the normal north. So some of the some of the the, the, the thermoluminescence was done in flint. Okay. And uh, there is also uh, there are also cooking stones. And uh, we tried to use uh, rock magnetism on the cooking stones, but it was not. It, it, the The problem is, is that they're the the they're granites, and it was not conclusive. Yeah. Uh, we got it published because a lot of things, other things happened, but the, the, the in this in this setting, rock magnetism didn't work. Uh, I think for identifying um, cooking stones. Yeah, I, I'm happy to discuss it further, but uh, I, I guess there were just a few studies. Before, before uh, the one I'm gonna forward to you. Um, so it's kind of kind of a new thing. Um, yeah. this, so it will be really important to get uh, pollen, absolute pollen intensity for the black event around the black event. But it's, I guess especially if you have some burn flints, yeah, that would be even better. Yeah, yeah. Which there are. Yeah. And um, and then I have a question that regards the. Um, so the black event is typically uh, constituted by two sub-events, and it's shown also in your data. If you go back to your uh, inclination, definition curves. Uh, sorry, the, uh... your your data, yeah. Yeah, and um, the, you mean that the, 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 yeah. the two, the two. Yeah. The, the two. Yeah. I have in the in the two thousand eleven paper we did. Do uh, like a, a, like the uh, how do you call that the, like the polar wandering, <laughs> of, of the, but I'm not that convinced anymore about it, <laughs> so I haven't used it. Also because this is just only part of because uh, uh, I think now that the Blake event is longer, so I, here I haven't in in uh, written I haven't done it. Okay, that that would is, be is that what you mean? Is the, like this the 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 migration of of, of uh, uh, the VGP? 
uh, no, I actually meant the uh, the feature it itself. It, it shows like a, a double double sub events. You can see from the paper by Osete 2012 from Sp some Speleotem in Spain. Yeah, in Spain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they act so the duration. Finally, if you consider they all, it will be maybe it will be maybe like four four or five thousand years, which is within. The excursion, the duration of the excursion we, that we've seen mm. somewhere else, say the Lachamp. Yeah, but the Lachamp oh. is, 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 is thought to be a lot shorter than the big. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, is, there is actually a, 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 a debate about the duration of the Lachamp as well, and, and the fact that it may not be a global event, or it is a global event, but uh, not so. It could be diaphanous, yeah. I guess. Well, um, I hope not. Maybe Katie can help me, or Sanya, I think Sanya is here. I'm but, working uh, on the Lachamp event now as well. I've, uh, it's a bit more, more. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Blake event is easier to find. <laughs> Kathy, you have muted yourself. You wanted to say something? Oh yeah, I was just going to say that I think uh, maybe Sanya should chime in here. But uh, what we see in uh, our attempts to figure out what's going on with the Lachamp is that it's followed by this period of generally low intensity where there seem to be a lot of uh, regional events rather than any kind of global event. Um, and that really complicates the issue for using uh, excursions as global markers. Yeah. Yes. Th thanks, Kathy. Yes. Uh, the Blake has been found with this double feature uh, in, s in several places and uh, of around the kind of the, the globe so that could kind of chip uh, in toward uh, like a more of a global event yeah but um, I, I, I don't I, I don't see it in this data okay so. all right thanks uh, I don't want to take up space from anyone else if anyone yeah. else has a question please go ahead to the voice of another one <laughs> Greg yeah, well, I mean, if nobody else has any quick questions, Anita, you can take up the last question for today. Then. Oh, no, no, I don't oh. want to take up the last question. Somebody else. <laughs> <please>. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mark. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, well, we'll, 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 bring it to, we'll bring it to a close there. So I think we can, we can all thank Mark again for uh, another fantastic talk uh, and for rounding off um, 2021 for us. Cheers, Mark. Um, let me just grab this screen share. So just before everybody um, uh, disappears off, um, just, just a reminder that was uh, the last um, seminar of, of 2021. Um, I want to thank again every, everybody who has attended the seminars over the last year or so. Uh, and uh, thanks to, to all of our speakers. We've had a, a great range of presentations uh, across a, a wide range of topics. Uh, and it's been really, it's been really fun and really enjoyable. Um, we will be back um, in, in 2022. Uh, and we are um, recruit, recruiting speakers. Uh, and as always, we're uh, wanting to encourage uh, early career scientists to, to, to give a, a magnets presentation. Uh, so if anybody uh, would like to give a presentation themselves or uh, would uh, know anybody who would like to give one, please, uh, by all means, get in touch and, and put forward that uh, recommendation. And if anybody has missed any of the seminars um, from, from this year, um, and, and from last year as well, um, they are all now on our uh, Magnets YouTube channel um, and uh, Mark's talk will be put up there uh, a little bit later this week. And, and just, I don't have a, an official announcement, but um, we will also be most likely including the UK Magnetic Interactions um, um, meeting, uh, which will run in early January next year. And so keep your eyes open for that um, on our YouTube channel um, uh, in early next year. But thanks, everybody, for um, coming along to Magnets, and we'll see you all in the new year. Cheers.